FDA advisors voted unanimously to recommend the authorization of the second shot of Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine. An agency committee backed the boosters for all recipients ages 18 and older at least two months after the first dose. The FDA is not bound to follow the advisory panel recommendations, but typically does. And it has been a busy week for the FDA. Earlier this week, the agency authorized electronic cigarettes for the first time, saying the Views Solo e-cigarette and its tobacco-flavored nicotine cartridges can help smokers cut back on traditional cigarettes. The agency also issued guidelines aimed at reducing sodium levels in dozens of foods like condiments, cereals, french fries, and potato chips, just to name a few, with the goal of cutting the average American sodium intake by 12%. Joining us now to talk about these issues is Dr. Anthony Harris. Dr. Harris is the Chief Innovation Officer and Associate Medical Director for Work Care and is board certified in Occupational and Environmental Medicine. Dr. Harris, as always, thank you for coming to News Nation tonight. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. So I want to start tonight uh, with the FDA advisor's endorsement of the Johnson & Johnson COVID booster. The panel cited uh, the growing worry that people who got the J&J &J vaccine appear to be less protected than those who got the Moderna or the Pfizer. So when do you think we can all expect to receive booster shots and will we be mixing and matching? So I think we're going to expect the booster shots right away, right? And the data is clear. The data was clear from day one, not surprisingly, that Johnson & Johnson had less efficacy uh, for protecting individuals from COVID-19 infections. We're talking 66 uh, to up to 73%. Uh, effectiveness, and that's compared to um, the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, above 88% and 90% effectiveness after the first dose. So uh, it, it only makes sense that Johnson & Johnson is going to uh, recommend or the FDA is going to recommend for Johnson & Johnson boosters uh, for everyone, and we should look to that. And just as a quick aside, we can look to Israel uh, for more data on the effectiveness of boosters. A booster shot, third shot, uh, can get you up to 95% effective at preventing COVID infection. That's the important metric we need to look towards. That's why we need to look towards booster shots. But meantime, here in the U.S., we're, we're throwing away COVID vaccines while other countries don't even have access to the first shot. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's so true, right? And, and you know, we know that uh, COVID-19, we won't see the other side of it until we have global immunity uh, to a sense uh, for COVID-19 infections. And the uh, strains that we're seeing now and the different variants that we're seeing now is a result of uh, the virus being able to spread in susceptible individuals worldwide. And so I uh, wholeheartedly support getting as many people worldwide, as WHO leadership has said, we want to vaccinate as many people worldwide as possible, as quickly as possible, to stem the spread of infection and the mutations that have been happening. But uh, at the same time, we are still suffering here in the U.S. Uh, disproportionately with higher mortality rates from COVID-19 than our neighbors across the pond. So that's also important to uh, underline the need for vaccination boosters. All right, I want to pivot now to, to food companies coming under pressure to use mm. less salt after the FDA spelled out those lower sodium guidelines. Uh, we mentioned some of the, the things that the apply here, French fries, condiments, mm. cereals, potato mm -hmm. chips. What do you make of this? And, and how does our salt consumption compare to the rest of the world? You betcha. So we trump basically every country in terms of consumption. Why? Because we consume more processed food. We consume more uh, restaurant food than other countries, uh, relatively speaking. And we know that is the source for higher sodium consumption. Sodium being table salt, basically, uh, when we're talking about cooking. And we know that comparatively, uh, people actually cook with less salt, less sodium when they cook in their home versus when we go out to restaurants and when we go out to uh, uh, consume pre uh, prepared foods. It's not to say that these foods are uh, inherently bad, but it's also to say that um, uh, agreeing with the recommendation that we should consume 2,300 milligrams. Uh, every two-year-old and older, on average, consumes 1,000 milligrams more than that on a daily basis. And so it, we know it's a big killer for our U.S. population. Half a million people die every year from uh, cardiovascular disease, and high blood pressure is the relation to that uh, loss of life. And so we have to do something about it, uh, along with what we're doing with other uh, chronic diseases. So. 
That restaurant food is so good, but if you saw some of the things that went into it to make it taste that good, we might think twice about it, right? And here's indeed, an announcement indeed. I never thought I'd see. The FDA authorizing the first e-cigarette and citing mm -hmm. a benefit for smokers. So apparently the thought process is that the e-cigarette can help wean traditional smokers off traditional cigarettes, but it also can it also go the other way, especially for teens? I agree with you wholeheartedly, right? So I'm from the South. My grandfather smoked cigarettes uh, for all his life, right, until his 80s. And uh, he said to me one day, and I remember this very clearly, hey, I'm going to switch over to cigars. I'm going to switch over to pipes to decrease uh, my need for consuming cigarettes, right? That's pretty much the same argument that has been made here by R.J. Reynolds. Now, we're talking about approval of a tobacco product, a nicotine-containing product. It's called Electronic Nicotine Delivery System, right? Literally, that's the name that was approved. And this is R.J. Reynolds that uh, popularized cigarette smokes, uh, smoking back in the 1800s. And so it doesn't make sense to approve a nicotine-containing product uh, to be widely marketed uh, to help decrease the dependence on nicotine. Uh, that's a big question mark there, right? Um, because we already have effective treatment for uh, nicotine addictions uh, on the market. And so we'll see how it plays out. FDA has said they're going to watch R.J. Reynolds very closely, make sure that they're adhering to the guidelines set forth in this approval, um, and we'll see if we have more data around whether or not this actually decreases nicotine dependence in all the patients that we see day in and day out. All right. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> thank you, Dr. <laughs> Harris, as always, for joining us tonight. Hey, thank you so much. Much appreciated.